Hello and welcome one and all to another episode of The Damage Report. I'm coming at you on a Tuesday with two bits of good news. The first you can probably already tell, we're back in the studio, <laughs> thank God. I mean, I love my house, I love being in it, but um, this is better for the purposes of the show. But much more important than that, forget the studio, Nina Turner joins us. Nina, how's it going? It's going, John. I'm happy you're back in the studio. That makes you happy, it makes me happy. I'm just happy. I'm happy for myself. I'm actually, I'm more happy for Anna Kasparian, who has had to deal with so many like audio issues that nobody can figure out what's causing them. And there's nothing more frustrating than a problem that is nobody's fault and can't be fixed. And so yes. for her mental state, I'm glad that we're back in. Um, and also it's just, it's easier for everyone. It's easier for our producers, easier for our graphics people, easier for our editors and and so thanks gods. Um, but anyway, very excited uh, for that. Very excited to have you joining us because we've got quite the rundown for today. Yes, uh, we do. Donald, we too. Donald Trump has a case of, um, he asked for something, now he's got it and it turns out he don't want it. We'll give you all the details in just a bit. Some petty business involving the Queen's funeral. Ron DeSantis starting to sweat over his stunt that he thought was such a great idea. And we've given Biden credit on a couple of different things over the past month or two. I've been enjoying Dark Brandon, I'm not gonna lie to you. But a couple of big missteps in the past week that we need to talk about. So we got that, we got Herschel Walker finally being honest about who he is. And a whole lot more besides, let alone in the aftermath. So if you're here right now, hit the like button so that people know we're live. It'll send out all the notifications and everything. And if you wanna send us any comments, tweets, or super chats, Nina and I will respond as we go. But with all that said, Nina, you ready to start the show? I am. Okay, let's do it. I'm actually like really excited for this first story, so let's do it. Oh wait, do we do we have like all of our B-roll again? Is that a thing again? We do? Okay, then let's do it. Let's put up some B-roll. Let's have some production value up in here, I like it. Okay, Donald Trump thought he had a great idea, okay? He's stuck in this issue with the FBI and Mar-a-Lago. It looks really bad because he definitely committed hundreds of crimes. But he had a judge, Judge Cannon, who he appointed and set up a bit of legal protection for him. And then he got the special master, not just a special master, the special master he wanted, Raymond Deary. And now, like 24 hours into the, the special master doing the work, all of a sudden he wants to tap out and he's not liking what's happening. So here's what it is. It's a really simple wrinkle. It was definitely going to come sooner or later. And here is how unprepared he, he and his legal team were for it. The court appointed special master Raymond Deary reviewing documents seized during the August 8th search has asked the former president to disclose details about any materials he claims to have declassified before calling them his property, okay? Seems like a pretty core concern. You took a bunch of documents, you say, nah, they were declassified, so I can't be in any trouble. And so he said, "Oh, show me some evidence of that. And they don't like that at all, they really, really don't. Trump's lawyers have expressed concern that Deary is posing questions about the documents that the judge, Eileen Cannon, who appointed Deary has left unasked. I don't even know what that, so? Uh, yes, he's doing the investigation, not the judge. There are gonna be some questions that the judge couldn't ask. But that's their first concern. They argue that Trump might be left at a legal disadvantage if he answers these questions at this stage of the process. They've repeatedly suggested, bear in mind, in court filings that the former president could have declassified the documents. But they have not notably actually asserted that he has done so. So they don't wanna provide any details about declassification, even though they keep saying he could have done it. But we're not saying that he did it, except, and this is a very important additional wrinkle, Trump has said publicly that he declassified it multiple times. So he has said that he's declassified it. His legal team refuses to say whether he did or not. And Raymond Deary's like, so could we just confirm this for like finally? Could we get around to whether you actually supposedly convert that declassified or not? And so Nina, this feels like like the core concern. It's it's not even if he did declassify, it's not the winner that he thinks, and we'll get into that. But if you can't provide this information, what is your defense at this point? Because most likely, John, he did not declassify these documents. And lo and behold, the special master is doing his job. Do tell. 
I think <laughs> Donald Trump, Mr. Trump, President Trump, former president, he just thought that the special master was going to roll over and not do his job. Well, he's doing his job and he's asking questions that they should be able to easily answer. I tell you, John, I would never, I mean, not that I would, but being a Trump lawyer has to be one of the hardest jobs in the universe. <laughs> Yeah, you like I'm not a lawyer, bear in mind. I don't know all that goes into like prep for like a case or whatever. But like the first question that the guy asked you, your legal defense can't be Homer backing into the bush. Like <laughs> you're you're going to have to talk to him and you're going to have to defend this eventually. Now, they think that they've got sort of a clever way to at least delay on this. So they say, and this is filed just yesterday, so this is this is breaking like as we speak the developments. And uh, oh, and by the way, Raymond Deary might be making um, possibly some statements later today. Trump's lawyers wrote that they don't want Deary to force Trump to quote fully and specifically disclose a defense to the merits of any subsequent indictment without such a requirement being evident in the district court's orders. So they are there saying. We could be in, like Trump could be indicted over this. That doesn't mean that they think it's super likely, but they're certainly preparing for it. And what they're saying is it wouldn't be fair for us to have to put up our defense now if that's the defense we would put up when we get indicted. And that, I think, maybe to many outsiders seems like a reasonable thing to claim. But that is so unreasonable. Literally, the only level of the defense that needs to be disclosed is is there literally any evidence that you declassified this? It's not, how are you gonna present the evidence? In what order are you gonna pull a my cousin Vinny and get an outside? No, literally, is there any reason to believe that you disclassified this? And they're like, I would really prefer not to say actually. So this this is coming off incredibly pathetic, Nina. And and you know, that's not really surprising, but I, I don't envy Fox News having to spin this later today. <laughs> Oh, but they gonna spin, John. Where there's a wheel to spin, there is a way. They will spin this. But abs, I mean, you really laid it out. It is. If it wasn't so serious, it would just be comical again, having mm -hmm. to deal with Trump himself. And you know what? Be careful what you wish for. They wanted this special master. They asked for it. They got it. And now they're they're shaking in their boots over what may or may not happen. But the way you laid it out is just simple. Did you or did you yeah. not declassify? We haven't even got to the complicated stuff yet. Yeah, no, 100%. Yeah, no, you're, you're totally right. Everybody loves the F around part of it. But when it comes around to the find out, suddenly they're not as Come interested on. anymore. That's the way that it always That's works. It. Yeah. And uh, so Deary is gonna meet uh, later today with uh, lawyers for Trump, as well as prosecutors for the Justice Department. Um, I, I don't know if anything will come out of that. Uh, what might come out of it is just some insane uh, bleats from Trump's Truth Social, I don't know. Uh, and 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 I don't think that they're going to clarify the declassification thing today. That seems like too early. But but I'm but I'm hoping for information along the way. And I have one very important good bit of news for you. Uh, I have been worried. I think as a lot of people uh, have been that this might get dragged out. You know, uh, Judge Cannon was like, uh, Deary's got to do his work by November 30th, I think it was. And then who knows like how much longer after that we have to wait to actually get the results and. Here's the thing, apparently it might be done quite a bit sooner than that. And so much sooner that maybe it'll happen before an important line in the sand politically. So let me give you the details. So Trump's lawyers, in addition to complaining about having to actually defend him, which I get it, I don't wanna work either. They also quibbled with Raymond Deary's proposed deadlines, contending that his draft plan, quote, compresses the entirety of the inspection and labeling process to be completed by October 7th, 2022. Now, again, not a lawyer, it's possible that there are phases that come after that, that might drag it out. But some portion of it will be done, not November 30th, but October 7th, which I did the research and that's before the midterms. So I think that that's exciting. Now, they're not happy about that. They wanna drag this out as long as possible. And here's how they, they argue for that. They say. We respectfully suggest that all of the deadlines can be extended to allow for a more realistic and complete assessment of the areas of disagreement. But think about how ridiculous that is. This is not a complex thing. This is not breaking down all of the themes of war and peace and all that. Did you declassify it or not? How much time does it take to, to, to confirm that? Either you've got the documentation, which spoiler alert, 
They literally cannot have the documentation, not in all the cases, because some of these documents he had no legal right to declassify, even if he went through the actual procedure, which I would bet basically every cent I have he didn't. So that's a fun little spoiler alert for you. But but anyway, like now they're complaining about it being done expeditiously. If Nina, if you'd been accused of stealing all of these documents from like Bernie Sanders campaign or something, wouldn't you want to wrap it up quickly? I would. Now, why you had to use that as an example? I'm hurt. I'm <laughs> I don't. Crushed. I'm not going to recover from this. You'd never. I'm not coming back never. to the rundown over it. <laughs> no, no, no. You never. <laughs> no, we, we trust just, you with any documents. I, I, no, absolutely. You would want it over quickly. But they have a rationale to delay, delay, deny, delay, delay. That is the defense. Mm. Deny and delay. Yep, 100%. And uh, so they're like, oh my God, I forgot. There's other things that they have a problem with. So super fast. So those are the main two complaints. Those are the most significant ones. Here's here's three and four. Uh, okay, so the third one is they also raised concerns, Trump's team, about Deary's request for information about whether any subsequent Fourth Amendment litigation filed by Trump, which they've sort of hinted that there might be over what was seized, uh, to reclaim the documents should be filed with the magistrate judge who authorized the search in the first place, Bruce Reinhardt. Who Trump is assailed without basis as biased against him. He said that the guy is totally biased. If you zoom out a bit, right wing media has launched any number of anti Semitic attacks. They've literally photoshopped Bruce Reinhardt as getting a foot massage with Ghislaine Maxwell. So they already are deranged when it comes to this guy, and he might be the judge weighing in on any Fourth Amendment lawsuits that come. Also, Trump, it's tomorrow, I believe is going to be starting the process of trying to convince an appeals court to not overrule Judge Eileen Cannon's argument. Because as we move forward with the special master process, remember the DOJ is technically appealing this as well. And so that's another wild card. So at this point, Nina, I don't know exactly how this is gonna go. I don't know the timeline upon which it's gonna proceed, but it is exciting. And I wanna make sure that we have a steady supply of popcorn as we proceed on this thing. Absolutely, John. What happened to that uh, special dragon crystal ball you have? What do you mean you can't see? You don't know what's going to happen <laughs> next. Well, we but know no, he is, did it, but yeah, I know. I, yeah, we don't know that. But delay, deny, and smear at this point, given the last point that you made about what they're trying to do with the person that may eventually be the one looking at the Fourth Amendment, that is the specialty of uh, Mr. Trump. Yeah, hundred percent. And while. I think it's pretty safe to say that the vast, vast, vast majority of Trump supporters don't care. There's nothing that'll come out of this no. that will convince them to do anything except maybe make them love him more. But I do wonder if Ron DeSantis is watching, waiting, wondering, is this potentially going to hurt? Not, not again, not not Trump with the base, but maybe the donors will get a little bit more nervous about a second Trump term. Maybe some of the more establishment Republicans will get a little bit more nervous about it. Is this really what the Republicans need going into 2024? Ron DeSantis, by the way, is generating his own massive potential legal liability. We'll get to that after the break, but maybe he'll seem comparatively like a safe bet. I don't know, what do you think? I don't know, John, from your lips to God's ears, I am, well, no, not him a safe bet. He worse than Trump in a way. Because he thinks mm-hmm. he's slick. You know, Trump is just out there being who he is. DeSantis, I think, is a lot more dangerous because there's a difference between the fox and the wolf. You know, mm-hmm. you're going to get jacked up by both, but at least with the wolf, you know where the wolf is coming from. Uh, DeSantis is a fox and just no good. So yeah. I just want him. Yeah, I can't wait till we get to him, to the story about him and the migrants a little later in the show. 100%. We've got one ridiculous little tidbit to gnaw on just briefly before that, though. Let's jump to what I am ready to declare on Tuesday. I know it's early as the dumbest thing we'll have to talk about this week. Let's launch into it. Donald Trump is super petty, you know that. And he's super salty over the fact that when big international events occur, nobody cares at all that he used to be president. They're not interested in him being there. And that includes the funerals of Queens. So when Biden got invited to the Queens funeral, Donald Trump decided to have a little hissy fit on Truth Social about it. Uh, Bleeding out in real estate, like in politics and in life, location is everything. Because as if you're watching this, you'll see Biden's seat wasn't at the front. And as we all know, what's the point of going to a queen's funeral if you don't have front row accommodations or something? Anyway, he goes on to say, 
this is what's happened to America in just two short years, no respect. However, a good time for our president to get to know the leaders of certain third world countries. If I were president, they wouldn't have sat me back there and our country would be much different than it is right now. I don't like what a dumb hypothetical that if the queen had died while you were still president, they would have been sure to put him in the front. That's definitely what the royal family would have wanted. But also, like Nina, I wasn't invited. I assume you weren't invited, right? That that's fine. Um, I assume that like family members and high-ranking UK-ish type people are probably sitting in the front rows. I don't think like Biden's cool or whatever. He's the president. But why would he be in the front row? And why does it matter what row he's in? What do you think? Trump is selfish as hell. I mean, this is not the time nor the place. It is not about him, but you see how he is very good at trying to make everything about him. And John Newsflash, at most funerals, whether it was the Queen's funeral or my uncle's funeral, the loved ones and the people closest Mm -hmm. to the family are the ones who sit closer to the front. Trump, that's just Trump being Trump. John, I don't even know what we're doing with this. This this man is know. just he's just so a selfish sure. ass. That's what he is. A hundred percent. You know, although this this topic does make me just just a little bit. Let's not go crazy, but just a little bit. Kind of wish that Trump was still president because I bet he'd be seated even further back, and it would be great to see the meltdown he has <laughs> of the disrespect. Right, if he was even invited. I mean, even at this moment, he's talking smack about where President Biden and the first lady is sitting. He wasn't even invited, for God's mm-hmm. sake. So you know, there it is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. did they invite? Did they invite Jimmy Carter? Oh, I wonder if they invited Jimmy Carter. That would be fun. But anyway, yeah, but absolutely yeah, he is ridiculous. The king of petty, though. Yeah, he should. At this point, I would say he should be a little bit less worried about him getting seats at the Queen's funeral and him setting up like that. Literally, anyone would want to go to his funeral, which can't be more than five or six years away. So anyway, that's just a prediction. That's all that is. Anyway, with that said, we're going to take our first break. When we come back, we got to we got to return to this migrant stunt that Ron DeSantis and Abbott of Texas are pulling. DeSantis starting to seem a little bit nervous maybe about the the reaction, the legal reaction of this. We'll give you all the details and more after this. People in the chat are like, hey, John Oliver is a good show. I'm joking, I know, I, lo- I love John Oliver's show. I watch like every episode. <laughs> yes, it's a, it's a good show and he deserves all the Emmys. Um, it's honestly probably, I don't even think it's close. In terms of political shows on TV, I don't, I don't watch, I don't think anything matches it. I mean, like think about the stuff that he was talking about like four, five, seven years before the rest of the, me- the mainstream media at least started talking about it. Anyway, um, you know what, let's focus more on this actual show for now. With that said, why don't we turn to a topic I know Nina is excited to talk about, starting with this. They all sign consent forms to go, and then the vendor that that is doing this for Florida provided them with a packet that had a map of Martha's Vineyard. It had the numbers for different services on Martha's Vineyard, and then it had numbers for the overall agencies in Massachusetts that handle things involving immigration and refugees. So it was clearly voluntary, and all the other nonsense you're hearing um, is just not true. Okay, so Ron DeSantis there is lying about the supposed consent that migrants gave. Consent means nothing if you lie to someone to get it. That's just not how consent works, but he's a Republican. I don't think he respects consent in a general sense. But that is actually not the interesting part of that video, the lie. We expect the lie. It's that he's talking about it at all. Why is Ron DeSantis suddenly so focused on, no, 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 there was consent and there were papers and there was all sorts of things. Last week after he pulled his stunt, of sending 50 migrants to Martha's Vineyard. He wasn't focused on consent forms. He was strutting his stuff, talking about this amazing thing he'd done, making the libs look bad and and owning Martha's Vineyard and all that. And suddenly he's focused on proving the consent. Well, why is that? I have a bit of an idea. Allow me to submit to you one potential explanation. It's because he's starting to sweat over the possible investigations of what appears to be certain laws that were broken. In fact, a sheriff in San Antonio, Bear County Sheriff Javier Salazar tweeted this. 
I've officially opened a criminal investigation against the individuals who lured and transported 48 migrants from the Migrant Resource Center in San Antonio to Martha's Vineyard. If you or someone you know has been impacted, he puts his email right there. Now, that's a sheriff in San Antonio where the migrants were bamboozled into agreeing to this. Uh, over in Martha's Vineyard, the state legislator representing Martha's Vineyard says, we are requesting the Department of Justice open an investigation to hold DeSantis and others accountable for these inhumane acts. Not only is it morally criminal, there are legal implications around fraud, kidnapping, deprivation of liberty, and human trafficking. And so I think this is fascinating, Nina. He thought, okay, I can do whatever I want. I'm a Republican, I'm a governor, I'm gonna get away with it. And in a legal sense, he might end up being right. But people didn't respond the way he thought. They were actually incensed by this. They're not gonna let it slide. They see that it's insane the use of Florida state money to take people from Texas to Massachusetts, let alone that you apparently lied to the people to get them to get on the plane. So Nina, I love that that some of these people aren't just laying down and they're they're actually gonna look into investigating this. I am too, John. I mean, this I gotta bring grandma into this conversation. It's a case of don't write a check, you're behind can't cash. Grandma said the <laughs> other word, but this is really what's happening. Thank you, grandma, for the mother wits. That's it. That's what it was. And, and you, mm-hmm. like you said, he was strutting this stuff. He thought he was clever. Now he's seeing the tables are turning on him, and rightfully so. You know, Jeff Weaver wrote a very great article in the Jacobin. Hopefully, the Dragon Squad has read that or will read that and lays out, even with Texas law, the, the, the legal violations, the potential legal violations that Governor DeSantis is involved in, and then also the feds. So I'm really happy to see the sheriff, Salazar, get involved in this, Representative Dillon. Let's go ahead and take it to him and make this man sweat. And ultimately, I do hope that he has to answer to the law because he is yeah. not above it and he should not be able to get away with this. And saying that they signed consent forms, as you laid out, John, what were they consenting to? You know, yeah. they know good and well. I mean, they just flat out lied. Did you see him sweating in that interview? I saw, I saw, I saw, I saw, I saw beads of sweat on, <laughs> on his forehead. In that mm-hmm. interview. Yeah. Yeah, no, 100%. Um, yeah, it, like consent means more than just getting, you can't hold a gun to someone's head and have them sign a contract. And you Fine. can't lie That's to right. them about the implications of signing it. If you promise certain benefits and you those don't exist, you never intended to give those, then that is not actual consent. That's not true consent. You willingly, intentionally deceive these people. Um, and I wanna read a quote from, uh, the Sheriff Salazar who said, what infuriates me most in this case is that we have 48 people who are already on hard times. They're here legally and I believe they were preyed upon, exactly. But but again, what the sheriff is doing there is seeing these 48 people as people. And that is something that neither Ron DeSantis or Sean Hannity who he was on with uh, ever stopped to do. And they're gonna betray that in a little bit. I'm gonna read a quote from Sean Hannity. Um, but just to be specific, cuz I made some like vague claims about this. They were promised eight months of cash assistance, employment services, housing assistance. They, there was never any intention to give them any of that. And who the hell thinks that they would get on that plane if that stuff hadn't been offered? I'll tell you who doesn't think that, Ron DeSantis. Which is why they lied to them, because they thought they needed to, to trick them to get on the plane. Assuming that those people would just, I don't know, whatever, they'll go in the woods or something, who cares? They're not real people and we'll just get our photo op out of it. And it'll be really awesome, Nina Turner. I feel like that's, he's supposed to be savvier and wittier than Donald Trump. I feel like that's as much as he thought about this. That is, and you know, we're, John, we're we're all the fiscal conservatives raising hell about the waste how how this governor just wasted taxpayers dollars in this way. Where are they at on this? Yep, 100%. All that money, I think it was like specifically on this flight, I think it was like 60 to $70,000. Like that could have char- gone to- chartering a plane? Yeah, I mean, yeah. really? You know, charter yeah, you an know, airplane to do this? I'm gonna look into it. I think there might be people in Florida who could have used that money. I'm not sure, maybe everything is cool in Florida, but I'm gonna look into it and I suspect there might be some people who could have used help, even conservatives who could have used help. But anyway, we'll see. Hello. Uh, I wanna turn to a slightly different angle on this though. Uh, I've been noticing a trend with Republicans, usually in defense of Donald Trump, but Ron DeSantis is gonna get into it too, which is literally any time they're accused of something that they actually said or actually did, they have this knee jerk need 
to very specifically turn it around on the other side. You can, it's like clockwork. You know it's gonna happen as soon as the claim is made. And so Ron DeSantis has been accused of using migrants in a cheap racist political stunt. And so what is he gonna have to do? Well, he can't let the stunt thing stand. He needs to turn it around. Take a look at this. Well, Sean, I think we should point out, you know, they accuse the governors of Arizona, Texas, and me of political stunts in terms of dealing with illegal immigration. But the biggest stunt was Biden coming into office and reversing Trump's policies, not because Trump's policies weren't working. He reversed them because he wanted to virtue signal to his base and he wanted to show that he thought Donald Trump was bad. And that's why he reversed it. And he reversed it knowing what would end up happening. And so he has done, he has pulled the biggest political stunt. How is that a stunt? I don't know. Ron DeSantis doesn't know. Sean Hannity was probably confused too, um, but he's of course not gonna ask an actual follow up, Nina. So he did a stunt, so now I don't know. It's some Biden did something. Something makes it a stunt in the same way that like like people voting for the Democrats is now an insurrection. I don't know. They said we did an insurrection, so I guess we have to say that they did an insurrection. I guess they called us fascists. Now we gotta say that they it's just it's so transparent the, the the projection from people like Ron DeSantis. I mean, he's grasping, John, because he's nervous. Mm-hmm. Governor DeSantis is nervous because he knows this one, this right here might be the very thing that ends his political career, and it should. Florida, get your governor. This is wrong on so many levels. No matter how we feel about immigration reform, and we do need to fix our broken immigration system, no doubt. But that has no, we're gonna put that in the parking lot for now. That has yeah. nothing to do with the misdeeds of this governor in the state of Florida. Florida, get your governor. He's giving yep. y'all a bad name. 100%. By the way, I want to, um, I, I was corrected by a member of the audience. Uh, I cited how much they spent on that flight. I apologize, I was off by a little. Only a factor of 10. It was over $600,000 on that particular thing, which honestly, how could you not buy a plane for that money if that's what you want to do? But anyway, it's a huge amount of money. They're eventually they're going to spend millions on this. Uh, that could obviously go to. So we have people in the audience who love DeSantis. Uh, like, uh, so you don't want the money to be spent on people in Florida? You think that him spending millions of dollars just to get some positive coverage on Fox News, having nothing to do with Florida, Floridians be damned, is a good call? You of course you do. You do. You don't actually care about any of this. But anyway, I want to go to one more graphic because. Obviously, the entire foundation of this stunt is fundamentally not seeing these migrants as fully human. And we've been focusing on Ron DeSantis because he's the guy that actually did it. But I want to go to one quote from Sean Hannity because he's obviously being super defensive towards Ron DeSantis. And he says this um, in, in defense of the like, this wasn't a stunt, it wasn't mean. All migrants were put up in hotels, given accommodations, they were fed, they were showered, they were offered haircuts. No, but like, Think for a second what you have to really think about these human beings to say that. Who the hell cares that we flew them somewhere else? We gave them a sandwich, we cut their hair, we even bathed them. And now you think we need to show them more respect than that? They He really thinks if you wash someone off and give them an apple, then whatever happens after that is totally fine. There is just such a deep seated disrespect and lack of compassion and empathy for other people, strictly along artificially created racial lines. Definitely, John. I mean, his bigotry is so bright, shining so brightly, uh, unfortunately. But this is Sean Hannity. We should not be surprised. I mean, asking, treating these people as though they don't matter, they don't count, and crumbs from the master's table, because that's what a haircut is, that's what's feeding them is compared to. Yep. Doing things that are necessary so that their material conditions can change in their lives for them and also for their children. So Sean Hannity, Sean Hannity is a biggie and 100%. he proves it over and over again. 100%. Okay, well, let's turn to him to Lindsey Graham. Lindsey Graham has received a lot of criticism, especially recently from the Republicans on his desire to ban abortion nationally. Has he bowed to that pressure? Well, let's take a look, take a look at this. This is not a state's rights issue, this is a human right issue. 
At 15 weeks, a baby sucks its thumb. At 20 weeks, you're encouraged to sing to a child because Which they can Which is what I am right now. I'm 20 okay, weeks. She's 20 weeks, folks. I, I don't care what California does uh, on most things. I care here. I am not going to sit on the sidelines in Washington, D.C. and tell the pro-life community Washington is closed for business. Lindsey Graham is doubling down on his desire to ban abortion at 15 weeks nationally, saying there it is not a state's rights issue. And it turns out for him, that's kind of a recent evolution. Take a look at this video. Saying that the 2015 Supreme Court decision that made same-sex marriage the law of the land nationally should be overturned? No, I am saying that I don't think it's going to be overturned. Nor should it be? Well, you know, that'd be up to the court. The reasoning, I think, could be attacked. But the point I'm trying to make is I've been consistent. I think states should decide the issue of marriage and states should decide the issue of abortion. And there it is. Not only saying that the states should be the ones to decide, but cloaking that position with, I've been consistent. And I, and I think he is. This at the end of the day is Lindsey Graham being honest, not in his words, but in his actions. When the Supreme Court hadn't weighed in, he wanted it to be a state's rights thing. He wanted them to have the freedom to ban it. And he didn't want to scare off too many people who weren't as rabidly pro-life as he is. Now that it's banned at the federal level, screw that state's rights thing. I want it to be banned literally everywhere. I do not want the states to have the right to actually give people the right to control of their own body they've had their entire lives. And so Nina, I get why the Republicans don't like him saying all this stuff. They all believe it and they wanna go way further than just banning it at 15 weeks. But it's really inconvenient to have this guy out on the news saying things that they all believe, but no, nobody actually likes. That's exactly right, John. I'm feeling another grandma moment. She used to say you could put truth in the river five days after lie. Truth gone catch up. And the truth is catching up today. And Lindsey Graham is out there spewing it how they really feel. And he is making everybody else nervous. I mean, I also think he's trying to be relevant to uh, Sean. You know, we, uh, John, excuse me. We do have, you know, he has a race in, in, in uh, the great state, in his great state. And he's really trying to be relevant right now. And when he talks about a human rights issue, the child tax credit was a human rights issue. Where was he using his, you know, all of his cachet on that? Uh, making sure that the parents of these children have jobs and that they are educated without uh, having debt for the rest of their lives. How about this, John? Can we have all of the Republicans who care about human rights to support increasing the federal minimum wage to $15 yeah. an hour? Let's go and do that right now. Because they all about human rights right now. Democrats. Go ahead and get your colleagues Republicans. They ready now. Let's increase that minimum wage to fifteen dollars an hour, so that the parents of, so that the parents will be able to support their their families. They are not pro life. They are pro birth. John, there is a difference. Hundred percent. Yeah, you have a right to live poor until the government kills you. That's basically you what they believe. That's it. Uh, they want a small government that is capable of taking your life if it suddenly gets the inclination to do so. Anyway, um, yes, I would like them to take that stance that you just suggested. One other thing I would like is a picture book for kids of all of the different sayings that you're throwing out here today. Because I think that that is important wisdom for the young. And I want to make that book now. Do we have any? Well, I know we have good illustrators in the audience, actually. Let's make that happen. Um, and each one, oh, it could be the wisdom of dragons. I like it. Anyway, um, with that it. said, <laughs> Why don't we turn to something related? We're, we're sticking to the reset uh, inside the C block here. Republicans would have you believe that they're totally satisfied with the destruction of Roe v. Wade. They don't want to go any further. Everybody chill out. Certainly don't let your fear that your bodily autonomy is being torn away from you influence your midterm vote. And yet at the same time, we here at the damage report are tracking what's happening in multiple states and they are moving fast. It, it's so out of step with what things like Marjorie Greene are saying, like everybody back off. We're not radicals, we're not crazy. Okay, well, uh, we might find out soon actually. As of today, a judge in Arizona might be ruling on whether uh, a ban of all abortions at all points can be enforced. So earlier this year, 
This is before the destruction of Roe v. Wade. The Arizona legislature passed a law outlawing abortion after 15 weeks. Actually, very similar to what Lindsey Graham is calling for and having you believe that that's as far as they want to go. At the same time, though, conservative lawmakers put language into the bill stating that the new legislation would not override a law from literally 1901 that bans abortion in all cases. And so now a judge is looking into it. Which are we going to have? Are we going to have a new ban at 15 weeks or will the ultra radicals get what they want? And Arizona, a state which is not a hardcore red state, it's going to be illegal in all cases. So everyone, fingers crossed, let's find out if people in Arizona have rights anymore. We also have West Virginia, Governor Jim Justice signed an abortion ban into law. So on two opposite ends of the country, rights being stripped away or soon to be. This one has exemptions for medical emergencies and for rape and incest victims until eight weeks of pregnancy for adults and 14 weeks for children. So if you've been raped um, you know, by a family member maybe, then you better move it along and do something about it fast. Don't process your trauma or anything. Aren't they filled with compassion in West Virginia? Oh, and you do have to go to the police. You know why? Because we assume that women are massive liars. We don't trust them when they claim that they've been raped. Um, so they need to go to the police, it's gonna be investigated. Them, the victim will be investigated. That is how radical they are. There is a little bit of good news, Nina. A, a judge in Ohio is apparently planning to extend a pause on a six week abortion ban there. That would mean that it can still be done uh, up until almost 22 weeks. Although God only knows when that'll be reversed. And so that's the state of thing in the states across the nation, Nina, what do you think? I mean, Roe v. Wade set up, set off this firestorm. We're not surprised. I am definitely happy about the, what the judge did in Hamilton County, the largest city in Hamilton County is Cincinnati, just so people can Thank have you. a little geography on that. It's the great city of Cincinnati. But yeah, I mean, this is what is happening all across this country. And this is another reason why, John, I believe, and so many others, not just me, that we need to expand the United States Supreme Court. Because these kinds of things, it's Roe v. Wade today, it'll be other things. We know that the justices have already put out there some other things that they want to turn around and take us back backwards. And we got to do something about it. We got to be able to fight back. And one of the best ways to fight back is to expand the United States Supreme Court one way. Okay. And they don't even get me started on the filibuster. So, 100%. Oh, yeah. I sigh. Codify Roe. How about that? We could do that. So, there we are. And John, I want to say I missed what, when I talked about Lindsey. Lindsey Graham already went through a race. I was talking about the, I was thinking about the great state of Kentucky when we were talking. I mean, one, oh, one, I see, one, I see. So I was thinking about Charles uh, Booker taking on Rand Paul in that moment. So please excuse my synapse lap there. I thought you were talking about his next race. So uh, don't his don't even worry race. about it. I get yeah. what you're saying. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh God, having it so close to home must be rough. But at least for now, pause. So that is good. Um, okay, yeah. with that said, uh, I think we should take our second break. We come back, uh, Dark Brandon has been getting a lot of buzz recently, but also behind the scenes making a few bad decisions. We're gonna reveal those after this. Okay, everybody, oh, Dark Brandon, you're on such a roll. But unfortunately, he's still Biden at the same time. So let's, let's jump into this. Is the pandemic over? The pandemic is over. We still have a problem with COVID. We're still doing a lot of work on it. It's, but the pandemic is over. If you notice, no one's wearing masks. Everybody seems to be in pretty good shape. And so I think it's changing. And I think this is a perfect example. Brandon, 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 why'd you have to do it? If you'll notice, nobody's wearing masks. Well, if you'll notice, nobody's around you. You might also remember you had COVID like a week ago, buddy. You just got over it. Now, look, we, the Director General of the World Health Organization says we've never been in a better place in the pandemic, but only if all countries, manufacturers, communities, and blah, 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 step up and take it seriously. Like internationally, people are still trying to take this seriously. But here's Joe Biden saying, we're done. We're done despite the fact that as you'll see in this graphic, we're still averaging between four and 500 deaths a day. 
We just passed below 60,000 diagnosed cases per day. God knows what the actual number is. And so to jump out there, I know the political calculation that he seems to be making, Nina. But this is literally the last thing we need when we still have so many people getting sick, so many people dying, and so many people suffering from long COVID. Don, I totally agree with that. And it is irresponsible to say that. It's not over as much as we would want it to be. We might be done with COVID. But COVID is not done with us. The pandemic is not done with us. And there are some deep seated, even ripple effects that are happening to people all over this country, all over the world that will never be done for a very, very long time because of the impact of this pandemic. So to say that, now to say that things are getting better, that's different from saying sure. that the pandemic is over. And for some people, things are not getting getting better, John. And what we lost, what over a million people died from this thing. So just to have that kind of, oh, we're out of it attitude does not make a whole lot of sense. It is irresponsible on the president's part. Yeah, yeah, no, it's just, it's it's not what's needed. I mean, we can we can acknowledge, as you're saying, the progress without pretending that it's done, um, and, right. and let's let's do that. Let, let's acknowledge the progress. So, while well, at the same time acknowledging how horrendous these numbers are, there were just over 440,000 new COVID cases and nearly 3,000 deaths from the virus in the U.S. in the past week. That's according to Johns Hopkins. 3,000 deaths. I, I like we're in the American context, so we have to say that's roughly a 9/11. This last week. Yeah. Now, yes, has it been worse? Sure, it's been worse. Um, the record high was 5.6 million cases over seven days last January and 23,300 deaths over seven days in January 2021. So yes, we're not in the dark winter anymore, but it is still now one of the top ranking ways that people die just every day. And, and my fear, Nina, is that he's sort of right, that it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's not over. Not literally, not by the numbers. We're still at, like, if you had told us on day one of the lockdown that we would have these numbers, we'd be terrified. But now we're, we're used to it. But I do think, in terms of, like, culturally, socially, taking it seriously, doing whatever's necessary to save life, I feel like that's gone and probably has been gone for some time. I think most people are, they're going back to their lives, they're willing to accept or ignore. The additional risk. I think very few people, if you were to ask them how many people died yesterday from COVID, I think very, very few people would get that number right. What do you think? Yeah, and, and we do. I mean, you're, the point that you're making, it's one thing to say, you know, to be a visionary on this. We are in this moment within human history. This is one of the harshest times for anybody living, you know, from a hundred years ago, you know, hundred years. We're gonna get through this. And we're going to do everything it takes. So taking what the general had to say about what the nations of the world have to do to get us through this as not only just a human species, but the whole ecosystem is dependent on us. That's one thing, John, but to say that it's over. And for some people, it is still winter because we know the poorest people in this country and also in this world are still suffering disproportionately yep. because of this pandemic and the social, political, and economic variables that impact people in this way because of the pandemic is not going to be done for quite some time. And um, Bishop Jamal Bryant from Georgia talked about how we lost over a million people died and there was no national mourning. I think his yeah. point is well taken. To your point about if you ask people how many people are dying right now or just died, they wouldn't know because they are disengaged from it. We gotta make sure that people are aware without inundating them. And we are losing ourselves by thinking that yeah. this thing is over. It is by no stretch of the imagination over. 100%, yeah. Yeah, and I think in terms of the knowledge, there's this weird mania around this where like Trump had his deranged rally this last weekend. And he said at one point, more people died uh, you know, in 2021 than the first year of the pandemic. Uh, because he said that because it's bad for Biden, right? Because Biden was president that year and more people died. And everyone in the crowd's like, yeah, boo. But at the same time, so is COVID serious? Should we do something about it? No, they don't think so. It's like they can have whatever reaction is needed in the moment. It's not a lingering thing. So, and, and politically, it works in the same way. So Biden comes out and says, 
the pandemic's over. Everybody, we're at car shows and stuff. And that's what the right has been asking for for years. Can we all just go back to normal? Uh, I think it was Greg Gutfeld criticized Biden for saying that today. Even though he thinks the pandemic is over, he wants it to be officially over. Biden, I guess, is thinking, you know what? I'll say this, get a little bit of credit. No, there'll be no credit. They hate you because you were saying something was serious that they don't think is. And now that you're saying that it's not, they pretend that it is. It's all just so whatever it needs to be. It's a very frustrating part of American politics. Anyway, there's some things that should be played with. This is one of them that should not. Done. And I'm not just I'm not just talking about the president's comments. I'm talking about the Republicans as well. Can we agree that yeah. this rises to the level of we got to do something about it and it has to be done collectively? I, I would hope we've been pushing for that for a long time. Okay, with that said, uh, we're gonna move on to the next bit of this block. We're, we'll get to, we, we're, we're gonna close with Herschel Walker. That's gonna have to wait for the aftermath. So if you're not watching the full show, uh, that'll be available on YouTube soon. But for now, why don't we jump into uh, this? And completely finished our original border wall plan. It was all done. And then we said, let's add 200, 200 miles more. And we had that almost finished. And then we had the rigged election. and. In three weeks, it would have been finished, and they said, we're not going to finish it. And that's when I realized there's something wrong when they didn't want to finish the border wall. So that's Trump at his rally last weekend, and those comments make Trump look terrible and moronic because he's lying. He didn't do as much as he said, and saying that, oh, I only had a problem with the Biden administration when they wouldn't finish the wall is ridiculous. It's ludicrous. But the truth of what's going on at the border doesn't make Trump look as bad as now it kind of makes Biden look. Take a look at what Biden had to say about the wall in the August before he was elected president. Trump campaigned on um, build that wall. Are you willing to tear that wall down? No, I'm, there will not be another foot of wall constructed on my administration. So that's Biden, he's gonna take this hard line. He knows that the Dems hate the wall, they hate the expense, they hate the racist basis for it. And yet new reporting updated on the status of the wall implies that that turns out not to be the case. US Customs and Border Protection confirmed that work on the border wall that began under Trump is revving back up under Biden. In an online presentation Wednesday, the Border Patrol Detailed plans to address environmental damage brought on by the former president's signature campaign promise and confirm that the wall will remain a permanent fixture on the Southwest for generations to come. They're gonna be repairing gates and roads, filling gaps in the wall that hadn't been constructed back when Biden was became president. And when asked if CBP envisions a day when the barriers might be removed, the agency says, no, we don't. And so the construction, the maintenance continues Despite the claims by Biden, despite the fact that Democrats hate it, Nina, what do you think? Hypocrisy, John. For those people who believe truly, like just they believe it is not a political ploy that the wall should not be there. Then if that's what you believe, neoliberals, if it was wrong when Trump was doing it, Trump administration, then it's wrong when the Biden administration is doing it. Mm -hmm. But you're not gonna hear neoliberals say a mumbling word because it's their team that's doing it. So they're gonna be quiet. At least the CBP was honest enough to say, no, it's not gonna stop, it's gonna continue. So this yeah. is nothing but flat out hypocrisy, John, at this point. It's just hypocrisy, You know, good job by The Intercept in reporting on that. There have been some earlier yeah. signs of this early this year and last year, but but this is a really good report that you can read more of on The Intercept. And, and it's disappointing, it's disappointing because of the substance of what's happening, the cost of what's happening, and also because We've been led to believe recently that Biden had become dark Brandon, and yet he's not laserizing down the wall or whatever. In fact, I have a plan. I would put the Republicans between a rock and a hard place. I would tell Republicans all across the country, you guys have these fantasies of using high powered military equipment. I'm gonna let you. I'm gonna let you use a rocket launcher, I'm gonna let you use a tank, I'm gonna let you use a mortar, I'm gonna let you use whatever you want, but you have to shoot at the wall. And you will see the sweat start to pour down their face. I want to shoot that thing, man. Put them in that position. That's dark, Brandon. Anyway, unfortunately, that's all the time we have. So uh, unless you're watching on Twitch and YouTube, then there is more show coming with me and Nina Turner. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back.
Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.